Good evening. Welcome to Face to Face. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. Our guest this week is Independent Senator Kim Pate. Senator Pate was appointed to the Red Chamber in November 2016. She's a nationally renowned advocate for who has spent nearly four decades working in and around the legal and penal systems of Canada, working with some of the most marginalized, victimized, and institutionalized youth, men, and women. Senator Pate is also the former executive director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies. And Senator Pate, it's a pleasure to have you on the show here and to be in your Ottawa office. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you for coming to visit. Uh, you've been traveling the country yourself, visiting and uh, studying Canada's prison systems. Uh, why? Well, just before I was appointed, in fact, the, the government was interested, the Human Rights Committee was interested in looking at prisoners' human rights. And so I was very fortunate, just as I was coming into the Senate, uh, the Human Rights Committee had decided to undertake this study, and so I, was, I became a member of the Human Rights Committee. And so for the better part of the last two years, we've been traveling across the country, as well as hearing from witnesses here in Ottawa. And so what have you been learning? Well, one of the things we've seen very clearly is that uh, there's a huge difference, a gulf between what the policy and legislation says should be happening and what's actually happening in our prisons. And the Correctional Investigators' reports have chronicled this now for decades, and we, we've really seen that as well, that we're seeing on the ground uh, people struggling to try and do the best they can with limited resources, whether it's staff, prisoners themselves, mm -hmm. and very few options really available to to uh, ensure that there's rehabilitation and uh, people are certainly being held accountable by going to prison uh, but you know, many times they're not coming out at the earliest opportunities. When we're talking about Indigenous prisoners in particular, um, the new legislation that's just been promoted will in fact limit even further what hasn't been implemented in the corrections legislation. So uh, a long way to go to actually achieve even just what our legislation promises. And so what comes out of this work that you're uh, traveling around studying? Well, there'll be an interim report, and my understanding is the interim report uh, should be drafted and ready to go uh, sometime before we, we rise for the, uh, the winter break. And so I'm hoping that we'll see something by the end of November. And that will be an interim report, and then there should be a final report following on uh, the heels. And hopefully what we'll see is some recommendations about what could really uh, change how we move forward and how, how we actually hold accountable um, those who aren't implementing the law in the way it's supposed to be or ensuring that the policies are implemented in the way that even the mandate letters to uh, the ministers of justice and public safety have, uh, have outlined they should be. So what do you mean when you say that they're not implementing the, the policy? Well, for instance, um, the legislation started out, it's a piece of human rights legislation, the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. And when it was brought in, the discussion that was happening in Parliament at the time, in the late 80s, early 90s, was that we needed to have some measures to decrease the number of people who were ending up in prison. So, and in particular, Indigenous prisoners. Since that time, we have doubled, in some cases quadrupled, for women. Indigenous women are one of the fastest growing prison populations, as well as those with mental health issues. So there are provisions in the legislation that were aimed specifically to try and limit those groups. Section 29 allows for people with mental health issues to be transferred out. Section 80 requires the, corrections, uh, the correctional system to consult with Indigenous communities, Indigenous groups. Section 80 requires that um, they engage in agreements with, uh, with communities and groups to have people go into the community to serve their sentences. And Section 84 deals with releasing people on conditional release, so parole into the community. And then Section 77 adds to that that if we're talking about women in particular, the need to be particular focus for programs and services for women. So you take all of that into account. There should have been really uh, innovative, creative new options being made available, particularly for women, Indigenous women prisoners. And instead, as the correctional investigator has pointed out, the numbers have continued to grow so that when I started doing my work with Elizabeth Fry, we were talking about women, Indigenous women being anywhere in the neighborhood of 10, 11, 12 percent mm -hmm. of the federal prison population. Now they're 40 percent of the federal prison population. What is has been taking place, I guess, that's led to the exact opposite uh, of the policies taking place? Well, as we see from the, the proposed legislation, one of the things um, that has happened is communities often didn't know what was in the legislation. And unless you go and develop 
uh, options and uh, information sessions for communities. How could they know what's in the corrections legislation? And then because they hadn't taken up those opportunities, some of those provisions haven't been fully implemented. As well, corrections policy has limited the, the law. Now that's not how the policy is supposed to work. The policy is supposed to help implement the law, not limit the application of it. And so, um, that, those are some ways it's happened. The other ways is that, you know, as we're seeing with the issues of missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, when you create environments where people are increasingly less equal and more marginalized, then you create a situation where, as we've seen with Indigenous women in particular, more likely to go missing, be disappeared, be found murdered end up on the street, end up in prison. And so the very same issues that have contributed to women uh, not having equal opportunities to uh, live, thrive, and be in society are part of what's contributed to them being overrepresented in prison. So we really have to look at uh, what we often refer to as the, the charter-based approach or a substantive equality provision. Why is it that women have, uh, are more likely to be poor, more likely to have experienced violence? 91% of Indigenous women in prison have histories of physical and or sexual abuse. Many of them then uh, the only option, if anything, that is provided to them to deal with that abuse and the, the trauma is oftentimes medication or they may self-medicate, so they end up seeing people with addictions, mm -hmm. mental health issues, and that just escalates. And so we end up with the intersections of all those degrees of mar marginalization, and so you end up with the poorest, uh, most victimized, uh, challenged women ending up in prison. As well, when they do, so they tend to be underprotected, under uh, supported in the community, but yet over policed if they do act uh, to defend themselves or their children. And so many of the women, Indigenous women and non Indigenous women, but especially Indigenous women who are in prison for what are often referred to as violent offenses, um, are often there because they've reacted to the violence they first experienced. So it doesn't excuse the violence. But it's a very different situation than the predatory acts that many people think of when they think of why uh, people are in prison for, uh, for assaults or violent acts or even homicides. Because in many of these situations, it was the woman responding to violence that she was experiencing, sometimes defensively, sometimes never having the benefit of self-defense or defense of other put to the jury or to the, to the court, sometimes pleading guilty because they felt guilty. Um, and so we end up with increasing numbers of people in for also longer periods and more harsh sentences. And then once they get to prison, because of the discriminatory um, classification scheme, they're more likely to be classified as higher security. If they're classified as higher security, they're more likely to be in the segregated maximum security units that exist in uh, pr federal penitentiaries for women. Less access to programs, services, elder support, uh, community. And so it, it really is, a, a, you know, a, it snowballs into this horrible situation of more and more disadvantage piling up and very much more difficulty to ever cascade back through the system, work on the issues that, you know, they may have that they want to work on that brought them there in the first place and ultimately reintegrate into the community. So it, it's become a really quite a vicious cycle. Senator, you've done something for the last two years that many people will never get the chance to or would maybe even want to do, and that is tour n a high number of prisons. Uh, what are some of the things that stick out to you from looking at uh, our penal system here in this country? Well, a couple of things that have struck a, a number of us on the committee is how uh, discouraged and how hopeless many of the prisoners feel. Uh, in the years previous to working with women, I worked with men and young people, and I used to often think of them as being uh, much more vocal, much more confident, expressing the issues that they had concerns about. And I wasn't prepared for just how, uh, how the impact of the last, particularly last two decades of reform in this country have led, led to fewer programs, um, more isolation, and, and really individuals feeling like they have uh, no matter how hard they want to work, how accountable they feel, the difficulty of actually addressing the issues that brought them into prison in the first place. And so that's been a shock to me. I, uh, I, I knew that that was existing for women, but I didn't realize it was as widespread. Um, the fact that we have so many people in prison with, uh, and so few programs and so few opportunities for them to actually work on 
as I say, the issues that brought them there in the first place is a problem. Uh, the, the, the elimination of many of the education and vocational training programs and work placements means that there are a lot of people sitting with very little to do. Even things like it used to be, uh, in fact, you know, all, all around my office and in, uh, when my children were younger, I had, you know, crafts and uh, toys and things that were made by prisoners that they would sell as a way to gain money to be able to send back home to their children, to their, their partners, their families to help support them. Hardly any of that happening because of um, the, the limitations now on how, how many t you know, hobbies they can do, what they can do with those resources. And, um, and really, I, you know, I, th I think we need to take a really clear and unblinded look at what, what is happening and say whether this is really what we want to be happening in Canada in our name. Because Canada has been a human rights leader for many, many, uh, for rightfully so, since, since we started the, um, uni you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, internationally. And I think we're not in a very good position right now. Senator Peta, I've got to uh, step aside for a, a quick break here, but then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face with Senator Kim Pei. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Independent Senator Kim Pate. And uh, Senator, we were just speaking of your, your tour of the prison system. Did you, were there things that you saw uh, on your tour that were concerning to you? There were a number of issues that were concerned. Oftentimes we would have a, a wonderful presentation from management and I have no doubt of their, their positive intention, just as I have no doubt about the ministers or the Commissioner of Corrections intention to be doing the right thing. Uh, what was really striking often was the difference between what we heard was happening and what we saw was happening because we went into the prisons and we would meet with individual prisoners as well as groups of prisoners. We would go into the segregation areas and we would talk to staff as we were walking through the institutions and a very different picture emerges when you visit a prison in that way mm -hmm. than if you just have received the presentation from management. And so despite best intentions, what's actually happening on the ground is we saw a lot of people locked up in their cells for most of the time, um, particularly those who are in the higher security areas, very little access to the community, very little access to each other, very little access to programs. And so the very people who we think of as needing the most intervention um, and being classified as higher security by corrections because they believe they need the most intervention, paradoxically are getting the least intervention. And so I think we really have to, you know, many years ago, there were recommendations made by the correctional investigator, by Louise Arbor, when she did the review of the situation at the prison for women in Kingston, that we actually should be looking at some of the best um, resourcing and putting the highest degree of intervention for those people who we see as having the greatest need, not those who are uh, get you know have done well are getting ready to go into the community and so really that's where I think you know many many of the resources should be loaded up because we're we're not seeing as much intervention there instead we're seeing people locked in increasingly segregated conditions in increasingly segregated units in increasingly secure prisons and so uh, and that becomes tautological it becomes self uh, reinforcing because if you lock people up because there, you know, there aren't enough things for them to do, and you promote anxiety, frustration, then you might see more volatility, both by staff and by prisoners. And so we know that some of the best interventions are those that involve human intervention, staff participating with prisoners, interacting, and we, we tended not to see as much of that. We tended to see a lot more of the separation and less of the modeling of the types of behavior that we all hope uh, is being modeled for people while they're in prison. Senator, you were someone who was hopeful that the uh, National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls would, would address the, the high incarceration rates of Indigenous women, and they're saying that uh, given their timeline that they didn't get the extension they wanted, that they're not going to make it into the prison system. Is that uh, a, a, a loss? I think it is a loss. I mean, when I was visiting with women in prison and talking to them about this issue, in fact, my understanding and awareness of this issue started with women who had been in prison who then would go missing, um, whether it was way back, uh, Georgina Pappen, 
uh, or other women who have who've gone missing over the years. And certainly every woman in prison knows someone who disappeared or was found murdered after being in prison. And so the fact that these are issues that are all along the same continuum and that uh, many of the women who are most at risk are women who have um, who have, have been pushed to the margins in all kinds of ways. It doesn't mean that every woman who's gone missing, obviously, has been involved in the prison system, but it is because the women who have been marginalized are also more likely to end up criminalized because of how they're trying to negotiate the poverty, the abuse, uh, the situations they have experienced, that these issues are very much linked. So I think it is a loss for all of us that those, if those connections are not made, I understand that they heard from witnesses who made those connections, so I'm hopeful still that the inquiry will have some recommendations that will, will um, fit into both, both areas. Why do you think there's been such an explosion in the numbers of Indigenous women in the prison system in the past 20 years? Well, I think we just need to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We, the Aboriginal, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples had a whole chapter also, Bridging the Cultural Divide, the Manitoba Inquiry, uh, Justice Inquiry as well. Um, and the, we know that the, the system has always, you know, the, the impact of colonization in terms of children being taken away, families, uh, the intergenerational impact of residential school, the the continuation of state forced removal of children, often referred to as the 60 scoop, mm -hmm. has all been part of what has contributed to more Indigenous people, particularly women being in the prison system. And then if you add to that the fact that we haven't taken serious, seriously violence against women, even more so when we talk about the intersection of that sexism and racism for Indigenous women, all of that is what's contributed to Indigenous women being the fastest growing prison population. It's not because when any of us walk out at night, we're most fearful of poor Indigenous women mm -hmm. who may have mental health issues. That's not who we're most fearful of walking alone at night. And yet that's, if you looked at who we're putting in prison at the highest rates, that's presumably who we're putting in prison apparently to protect the public. But in fact, we know that's not true. Senator, I did want to touch on uh, on healing lodges and, and access to cultural programs. Obviously, we're hearing a lot about it, like the one offered to convicted child killer Terry Lynn McClintock. But we hear that a lot of Indigenous people can't access these programs. Is there a, a big waiting list of people hoping to access these programs? Well, in fact, the elders and the vision keepers who first envisioned the healing lodge wanted it to be for those women at the prison for women who were often locked in segregation and in the the highest security wing. Uh, it, in fact, it was built, the first healing lodge was, that was built for women, the Okima Ochi Healing Lodge, was built with the idea that um, all levels of security, w women with all levels of security would go there. And the correctional investigator in his most recent report reminded everybody, including obviously the Minister of Public Safety, that the plans for all of the new, uh, or they're now more than 20 years old, but the regional prisons for women, was that they recognized that most women come in at low security and could be dealt with in a very different way. Uh, the, the challenge was that because of the classification system being, as the Human Rights Commission found in 2003 and as the Supreme Court of Canada recently found in the Ewart decision, uh, is, is biased in the terms of class, race, and ability. Uh, the reality is we see Indigenous people more likely to be classified as higher. And so because Corrections has focused on lower security for the Healing Lodge, uh, we end up seeing a lot of Indigenous women and men not being eligible to go to the... In fact, when they opened the Healing Lodge that's run by the Native Counseling Services of Alberta in Edmonton for women, the Buffalo Sage, initially there were no women eligible to go there because of this, they required them to be at minimum security. Mm -hmm. And they had to... And it, but it also showed how quickly correction, corrections can change that when they have the will because they changed the policy and they changed the practice and allowed women to go there. I think we really f have to fundamentally look at, are we making a concerted effort to address the needs of Indigenous women and men, but in this case Indigenous women, so that their needs can be met and have access to elders, have access to cultural programming, have access to the supports that will assist them to go into the community and be successful. Senator, we're going to have to uh, pause for uh, another moment here and uh, we'll be right back here on Face to Face with Senator Kim Pate.
Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Independent Senator Kim Pate. And Senator Pate, we mentioned off the top of the show your four decades of working in this field and just wondering why it's something you've dedicated so much of your life to. Well, one of the reasons is as I started doing this work um, fairly, pretty much while I was still in school, I started to see that the people who are in jail tend to be the people who had the least. That while we know, you'd know of people, you'd hear of people doing things that were wrong, um, they may not, they might have a good lawyer, they might be able to afford to pay for treatment. Um, they, and you know, we know things like impaired driving are one of the most litigated areas, uh, but people don't all go to jail for it. You can, you can actually get treatment if, and you can avoid the mandatory minimum penalty if you get treatment. And so it became really clear that the people who had the least were the tended to be the most impacted both by those who were victimized as well as those who ended up criminalized and imprisoned and so um, it became really a, a function of not just what was happening in the prison system but the prisons as the example of what happens when every other system fails and so I although I'm you know I, my work in the prisons is probably what is more known I also try to work on things like guaranteed livable incomes mm -hmm. um, adequate health and particularly mental health care in the community and the need for national standards around all of those areas to actually try and create a better standard of living and better living circumstances for all Canadians not uh, not just those who are who have more wealth and so uh, that meant that you end up focusing where you see the, the biggest problems and that's often in the prison system because if, if we don't have a good homeless strategy to deal with homelessness, to deal with poverty, mm -hmm. then the place that can't say no, that can't return people away because their beds are full or because they doesn't fit their mandate is the prison system. And it doesn't take much if someone's behavior is problematic to other people to have a, a charge and so I can't tell you how many police officers I've come to know or people working in the system who themselves lament including many of the officers we've met during the prison study who will say really these are individuals who don't belong here um, if we had appropriate health services in the community addiction services mental health services most of the people wouldn't be in prison and instead um, it's the only place that uh, so it's the, the most expensive least effective way to deal with many of our social problems. Senator, knowing we only have about 30 seconds left, has it been, uh, uh, have things gotten worse over that four decades that you've been working on this? Um, things have gotten worse because we have not dealt with the inequality and I think we have to deal with the economic, racial and gender inequality in this country and we need to hold ourselves accountable to each other but also hold the government to account for not addressing these issues. Otherwise we continue to push more and more people to the margins and will result in more people being victimized and criminalized. Senator, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show and uh, we thank you for having us here in your office in Ottawa and for the work you do. And uh, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately, but appreciate you taking some time to join us here on Face to Face. And that is all the time we have for this week. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. We'll see you back here next week.